I'm going to ask you, if you would, to uh, join me in the book of Ezra. We're going to read from chapter 9 and chapter 10. What I, what I really want to share with you this morning is from a passage of text that I discovered a number of years ago while I was just reading through the Bible every morning. And when I came across this particular text, like it, it really spoke to me and really ministered to me on a personal level. And so when we were talking about coming into 2023 and starting a new year and not just having resolutions, but actually believing God for spiritual renewal, I felt like this would be a great text for us to evaluate. Because what I discover within this text is that there really is the cure for culture. We understand, man, our culture's messed up. Our society's got a lot of problems, but God has a cure for all of that. We're gonna look at what we can find through Ezra and what it means to us corporately and individually. Ezra chapter 10, verse one. Now, Ezra was praying, and while he was confessing, weeping, bowing down. I mean, what a beautiful picture of intense, fervent, heartfelt prayer. He's confessing, he's weeping, he's bowing down. He's with a large assembly of men and women and children. This prayer meeting, uh, not only the adults, but the kids showed up for it. And the people began to weep bitterly because they were in a time of repentance for their sin. And so Ezra rose up from before the house of God and he ate no bread and he drank no water. So he's not just leading them in a time of prayer, but he's actually also exemplifying fasting out of the spiritual hunger that he has for God to move on behalf of his nation and his community. And so he mourned because of the guilt of those from captivity who had continued to sin against God. So in other words, these people have been set free from captivity, but they've not responded by honoring to God on the other side of that freedom. Instead, they're continuing in sin. Now, Ezra chapter nine, verse nine, gives us a little more of a picture in context. It says, for we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, repair us, and to rebuild the ruins. That's what we're believing for, right? Revival, for repair, and for rebuilding. I believe that's gonna come on the other side of repentance. I want to talk to you about the cure for culture. Father, help me to teach, help me to preach. I pray, God, you would use this moment that your kingdom would come, your will would be done, that hell would be pushed back and heaven would come down. Lord, let it be done in Jesus' name. And this church said, amen. You know, typically when you think about having something named after you, that's considered an honor. That's something you might actually look forward to or be excited about. But there's also those instances where that something has been named after someone and now their name is associated with the infamy of that thing. For instance, there's a man whose last name you might recognize. His name is Charles Ponzi of the Ponzi scheme. Here's the way that it unfolded. Uh, Ponzi I went into foreign countries and he bought postal reply coupons. He then brought them into his nation and he sold them for a profit. So you might think of it like this. You go to Mexico, you buy something for a dollar, you bring it to America, you sell it for a dollar and a half. The more times you do that, the more money you're going to make. Well, what happened with Ponzi is that he actually stopped buying the postal reply coupons once he got investors for his idea. So he would get people to invest on this idea. I'm gonna use your money to go into this country and buy this item. Then we're gonna bring it to this other country and we're gonna sell it for a profit. And because I have your investment, we can do a larger scale of this. Well, what he started doing was just getting investor one to make a donation or to, to make an investment based on this idea of a 50 to 100% return, then he would go to investor two, take his investment, use it to pay investor one, get investor one all excited with the word of mouth telling everybody about it, then go get investor three to double the investment of investor two, use that to pay investor two, now investor two's excited, and all this word of mouth spreads to the point that there's $20 million invested in something that has no value, and people lost everything that they put into that. Here's the way it looked. On the outside, it looked like Ponzi was a genius. It looked like that he was leading everybody into blessing. But underneath, there was actually nothing of value taking place. All that was really transpiring is that this thing was being shuffled to that thing and that thing being shuffled to this thing. 
I believe that that describes a lot of us spiritually. That it might look like on the outside that we got a lot going right. It might look like our family's got it together. It might look like we've got the career thing figured out. It might look like that we're prosperous. But if you could really look to the inside, a lot of us are lacking value because all we're really doing is just shuffling stuff around. What, what happened in Ezra's day is something spiritually related to the Ponzi scheme. In that, it appeared as though these people were in this time of great blessing. They've been set free from captivity. They're repairing stuff. They're rebuilding stuff. They're restoring stuff. There's new construction and remodeling projects popping up all over the place. But inside, these people had never learned anything from their time of captivity, and they're actually struggling with all kinds of sin, major sin issues, and they start even though they got the outside going on, inside they're shuffling around in their relationship with God. And the same thing that happened with the Ponzi scheme when the bubble burst is the same thing that's going to happen to you and me if we don't get the inside fixed in regards to having a true, meaningful, authentic relationship with God. And so I want you to understand something this morning. As we walk through this, there's going to be one bottom line to everything I'm going to say, and it's this. When sin is the problem... The only cure is repentance. I'm going to say it again. When sin is the problem, the only cure is repentance. And that's actually what you see Ezra lead his people to is that kind of an understanding. Now, thankfully, when we step into meaningful and authentic repentance, we have the cross of Jesus Christ that gives us an avenue to freedom. So when sin is our problem, and we meaningfully and authentically repent of that sin, the cross gives us an incredible bridge. The Bible says, where sin doeth abound, grace doeth much more abound. Now, think about it. Sin digs a pit. Sin digs a valley. And so when we're in sin, we wind up in this really big pit. But where we want to get back to is the mountaintop. And the only, only way we can get to that view is through grace. We need a bridge to get from the pit to get to the mountaintop view. And so the way that Charles Spurgeon, uh, who's believed to be one of the greatest preachers in all of the 1800s, pastored the world's first megachurch, preached six times every Sunday, believed to be just an incredible orator, here's the way he described that. He said, the bridge of grace will bear your weight, brother. Thousands of big sinners have gone across that bridge. Yea, tens of thousands have gone over it. Some have been the chief of sinners, and some have come at the very last of their days. But the ark has never yielded beneath their weight. I will go with them trusting to that same support. It will bear me over as it has for them. Anybody thankful for the bridge of grace? That it doesn't matter how heavy your sin is, doesn't matter how deep your sin is, doesn't matter how bad your sin is, how condemned you feel as a result of your sin. If you will get on that bridge, you'll come out of the pit and you'll go to the view that only grace can give you. So what is the access point to that bridge? It's repentance. Because when sin is the problem, the only cure is repentance. And so what you're going to see um, is that sin... If, if, you, if you don't repent of your sin, if you don't confess your sin, what starts to happen is it starts to eat you up from the inside out. David, he's one of the most prolific figures in all the Old Testament. He was a great king. He was a great warrior. He was renowned in his day and in his hour. But scripture teaches us that he entered a time where he was partaking of sin he was partaking of that sin secretly. He wasn't repenting of it, and he had not confessed it. Here's how he describes that season of his life, Psalm 32, 3. He said, when I kept silent about my sin, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. Look at that. When I kept silent about my sin, my bones grew old. They caused me to groan all the day long. What's he saying? He's saying that when you have sin and you don't repent of it and you don't confess it, the, the guilt and the condemnation associated with that sin starts to eat you up from the inside out. And so you might not even be a believer, but you still have a conscience. 
And that conscience is the way in which that the Holy Spirit speaks to you and reveals to you what is of God and what is not of God. And, and if you continue to ignore that conscience and ultimately searing that conscience, what you'll discover is that that sin is just going to continue to eat a at you. And I think that's a lot of what's going on in our culture. It's a lot of what's going on in our society. There's people that are so angry. There's people that are struggling with so much anxiety. And I think that that's some kind of a deal to try to divert the energy that is associated with the guilt of sin. The cure for culture is repentance. When sin is the problem, the only cure is repentance. Now, what you're going to see is Ezra is going to give us a beautiful example of repentance. And his example is so effective, it's so beautiful, that it leads to incredible revival in his entire nation. But when you first start reading it, like, I mean, Ezra looks like a drama queen. Like his response to finding out that his nation was in sin, in sin like it actually seems like it's just totally over the top. So before I show you what that picture looks like, I want to like, just paint this visual for a second. Well, let's imagine that you walk up and you see a dad and he's correcting a child. And he's being you know, pretty aggressive, fairly stern, and he's really getting his point across. And this is your first exposure to the interaction between the father and the son. And you're like, man, it seems like that dad's a little over the top and seems like he's you know, really kind of being overly stern. But maybe what you haven't seen is that 20 times prior, the dad has tried to get the kid to stop doing that thing. So when you have the perspective of it, it makes a little more sense. So when you see what happens with Ezra, it's, it's like he finds out the people of Israel have been set free from captivity, have come back into their land, and they're once again in sin. Last week we talked about Deuteronomy 27, 28. So here's kind of the summary of that. In the Old Testament, they lived under this understanding and it's found in Deuteronomy 27, 28. Bottom line, point blank, here's what it is. If you do what God wants you to do, you're going to be blessed. If you don't do what God wants you to do, you're going to be cursed. That is the rules of the Old Testament. Do what God wants you to do, be blessed. Don't do what God wants you to do, be cursed. The people of Israel did not do what God wanted them to do. And the result was God allowed the Babylonian empire to invade the nation of Israel and take the people of Israel captive and drag them away into a foreign land for 70 years. Then Cyrus, who leads the Persian empire, comes in, overwhelms the Babylonian empire, and now the Persians are in charge. The Israelites had more favor with the Persians than they did with the Babylonians. And so Cyrus says, I'm going to let the Israelites go back to their homeland. I'm going to let them start repairing. I'm going to let them start rebuilding. I'm going to let them start restoring. The guy that he puts in charge of all this is guess who? A man named Ezra. And so Ezra is leading this charge. We've been set free from captivity. We're repairing. We're rebuilding. We're restoring. I mean, God has done an incredible thing for us. Like it looked like we were never going to get free and God made a way where there seemed to be no way. And guys, we get to be a part of this incredible restoration in our nation. Like our culture is going to be transformed. Our society is going to be restored. And then Ezra gets word that these people have more wicked sins since they have returned than they did at the time they left. And here's what the Bible says Ezra did. Ezra chapter nine, verse three. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and I pulled my hair from my head and my beard and I sat appalled. That word appalled in the Hebrew, it means dumbfounded. Now, some of you feel like you've been some stuff through some stuff where you thought you was gonna pull your hair out of your head. Anybody else raising teenagers? Anybody else ever tried to help someone through a struggle that they just couldn't seem to get over? Uh, th that's the reason Ezra is so dramatic. He's like, are you kidding me? Like, we just spent 70 years in captivity, prisoners to a foreign land. We just got back and we were under the curse. Now we're under, no, no, why is this not getting through? 
Why is this not getting through? Like, at what point is God going to be able to get our attention? Sound familiar? Reminds me of maybe you've seen someone struggle with a gambling addiction. Maybe you've even helped someone with a gambling addiction. And, and gambling, when it becomes an addiction, man, it can cost people everything. We've all seen people lose their homes, lose their cars, lose their family, lose everything as a result of that addiction. Well, let's say one of those people in particular, you're moved in your heart to want to help them. And like you're broken by their situation. And so you're like, okay, I'm going to give my time. I'm going to give my talent. I'm going to give my treasure. I'm going to help you get your life put back together. And so the process begins. They get their car back. They get their job back. They get their house back. They get their family back. And then you find out after everything you have invested and after all this freedom from captivity that they have achieved, you discover that they're out buying thousands of dollars of lottery tickets. That kind of thing will make you pull your hair out of your head. And that's what's happening with Ezra. Of like, why? Why have we not learned anything from the season of captivity that we went through? Like, why has it not gotten through to us that there's going to have to be some kind of change if we're going to stay free? And so I do appreciate with Ezra that he didn't get on social media and start blasting everybody. And I appreciate the fact that he didn't get over in the corner and start gossiping about all this sin that he was hearing of. What I love about Ezra is that the man just draws a line in the sand and he says, there's only one way to fix this. If sin is the problem, then the only cure is repentance. And so we're going to have to go talk to God about this situation. And so what you see in Ezra chapter 9 is really four aspects of what repentance can be and what repentance can look like in our life. And so the first example is in Ezra chapter 9 verse 1. And what he says, he said, the people of Israel have not separated themselves from the people of the lands with respect to the abominations of these inhabitants. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and the rulers has been foremost in this trespass through sinful marriages. Now, what he's teaching you here is you have to name the sin. Just say that aloud with me. Name the sin. Now, what he talked about is there's an issue with the marriages. And what he's pointing out is that when the Israelite people came back into the promised land, there were Jebusites and Canaanites and Moabites and Edomites and all kinds of foreign people that had taken up residence. The issue with that is that these people served pagan gods, served false gods. They were idolaters. And when the people of Israel came back in, they made the mistake of that they were driven by their flesh to the point they started marrying these people who were pagans and instead of leading the pagan to God, they allowed the pagan to lead them to false gods. And, and Ezra's like, after everything we have been through with captivity, why do you not understand what fellowship hath light with darkness? Like, why don't you realize that we cannot be unequally yoked? And so there's this brokenness that arises within him. And he says, we got to name the sin. Can I tell you that when repentance really takes over your heart, you're not afraid to name the sin? Like you stop making excuses. You stop trying to sweep it under the rug. You stop trying to like explain to God why you did this or why you did that. And you just lay it all on the line and you name the sin. God, this is where I failed. This is where I came up short. This is where I stumbled. This is where I did not do what you wanted me to do. And you name the sin the sin. Don't be afraid to name the sin. In fact, I would strongly encourage you that if you've got a hurt, a habit, or a hang-up that's become sinful in your life, name the sin. In a time of prayer with authentic repentance, like get it out on the altar before God and admit the struggle. Name the sin. The second thing that you see is in Ezra chapter 9 verse 3. He says, so when I heard this thing, I tore my garment and I plucked out some of the hair of my head and my beard, and I sat down astonished. What he shows us here is that we should grieve the sin. Now, what some scholars believe is happening here is that when Ezra stepped into this level of demonstration, 
They think that he was actually prophetically painting a picture of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. So you remember when Jesus went into the garden before he was to be taken to the cross? And the Bible says he began to pray. He began to weep. He began to cry out to the point that his sweat became great drops of blood. What Jesus was showing us in that moment is that sin cost something. That sin, sin is associated with consequence. And so we, Ezra's painting this picture of what sin cost heaven. And he weeps bitterly just as Jesus would weep bitterly. But he also, I think, shows us just like the Old Testament does a lot of times. Here's something to understand about the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when you see symbolism, many times in the New Testament, that's meant to show us inward expression. So outward symbolism in the Old Testament equals inward expression in the New Testament. So in the, Old, in the Old Testament, here's this guy. He's ripping his hair out of his head. He's ripping his beard out of his face. He's tearing his clothes off. Please do not do that at the altar at the conclusion of this service. <laughs> not the point. What is the point, according to Scripture, is you rend your heart and not your garment. That's the New Testament. Of where you grieve your sin. And you understand the guilt that is associated with your sin. And so there's a humility that brings you before God. And you're like, I understand this, this cost Jesus the cross. I understand this caused blood to be shed by the Son of God on earth. And, and there's a grieving associated with, I don't want to live this way anymore. I want this old mess to pass away, and I want to become new in Christ Jesus. There's a humility that is associated with that. Uh, here, here's, here's a great verse to help you get it. It's New Testament verses, James chapter 4, verse 6. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. It's another example of what authentic repentance looks like that there is a legitimate concern about sin in our life. I would venture to say to you that if sin doesn't bother you, you're probably not saved. Because when the Holy Spirit of God is living on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit's gonna have a problem with sin. Now, any man that says he's without sin is a liar because all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. At the best we can do until we're on the other side of the pearly gates, living in a glorified life, we're still going to stumble, we're still going to mess up, we're still going to make mistakes. But we don't just casually approach that sin as like, oh yeah, I goofed up again. Romans chapter 6 says, God forbid, God forbid that we have that kind of attitude towards sin. So the sin should bother us, not in a condemned way that God's never going to use us again, but in a convicting way of I'm going to have to get a little closer to the cross. I'm going to have to get a little closer to Jesus Christ so that this mess no longer becomes my story. Make sense? So, so we're grieving the sin, not from a condemning place, but from a convicting place showing that we're not proud in our sin, but we're humbled in our sin. And God says, I can give grace to that. I think when you see a nation and a culture begin to shake its fist at God, that nation and that culture has stepped into extremely dangerous ground. There has to be a humility because pride goes before a fall. It is not a suggestion, it is a rule and it is scriptural. And so when we sow humility, we reap grace. But when we sow pride, we reap destruction. And if you've been reaping destruction, it may be that you've been sowing pride. But if you would start sowing humility, you'll start reaping grace. And there'll be a flood of grace that will come into your situation, come into your life, and God will lift up and exalt and bring you to a view you never thought was possible because of grace. So, so what we're going to do, we're going to name this in. We're going to grieve the sin out of humility. But then, number three, we're going to turn from the sin. And that's actually what Ezra, we, we don't have time to read all the verses, but uh, chapter 9 and chapter 10, the, the people actually decide they're going to turn from the sin. Like they realize, okay, we have to change. We, we need to learn something from our season of captivity. And so they make a decision to 
turn from the sin. Some of you have been wanting to preach for a long time. Just look over at somebody and tell them, turn from the sin. Because you know what most of us resemble in regards to our relationship with God? Let's imagine a driver. Some of you, it's not going to be hard to imagine. Is driving too fast. And the cop pulls you over. And the cop comes up to the driver's window and you start with all of your excuses and begging for forgiveness. And the cop is a, is a cool guy. He's like, you know what? I'm going to let you go. And then as soon as the cop is out of sight, you are once again going 20 miles per hour over the speed limit. That is not repentance. That is saying I'm sorry and refusing to change your ways. And that is a dangerous attitude to take into your relationship with God. Of, oh, Jesus, forgive me. Oh, Jesus, you know, she, she just seduced me. Oh, Jesus, he just talked me into doing something I should have never done. Oh, Jesus. I ain't going to get no help on a Sunday morning. I'm going to preach anyway. Like, it's what happens. Like, it, it's, we make the excuse, and then the first time the church is in the rearview window, or we're out of the small group, or the people who hold us accountable are not around, we go back to speeding. That's not repentance. That's habitual sin. And so the way that you can know that we have repented is when we begin to make a legitimate effort to change. And that starts with changing your mindset. And a lot of the times the stuff that comes out of us is a direct result of what we put into us. So if you want to renew your mind, guard your heart. And what you let into your heart is going to help you live with a renewed mind. And so turn from, that's where repentance starts is a decision of I'm not going to pursue this way of life any longer because it's contrary to Jesus and his will for my life. And so name the sin, humbly grieve the sin, but number three, turn from the sin. Well, here's the thing. We can't do any of that on our own. I, I mean, we can name it, but what good's it going to do if there's no supernatural power involved? And we can grieve it, but what's accomplished if the throne room of heaven isn't experiencing that grieving that we're offering humbly. And, and so that last part is turn from the sin. The only way we can turn is if grace shows up. And grace is what's going to make the old thing pass away and everything become new on the other side of our faith that God can and will do that for us. So here's the last thing. Embrace grace. Ezra chapter 9 verse 8. And now grace has been shown from the Lord our God in response to our prayer that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival. Somebody say amen. amen. For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us to revive us, to repair, to rebuild, to give us a wall. Verse 13, and after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us deliverance such as this. Could somebody give God praise for a minute for the deliverance such as this? Like, I'm serious. There has to be a celebration of grace and mercy that is available. We all deserved death. We all deserved to stay in captivity and to stay in the bondage that our sin created. But thank God when we come before him with meaningful repentance, he says to us, not only will I not give you what you deserve, but I will give you grace. And grace isn't just being set free. It is being given something that you don't deserve, being gifted with something that you don't deserve. So so embrace grace. And so I think like when we look at the understanding God's trying to bring us to this morning, it's this, when sin is the problem, the only cure is repentance. And what we've seen this morning is a picture of what repentance can and probably should look like. And when we think about it, what Ezra is exemplifying is that it's not just a repentance for us as individuals. But it's an example of what repentance can look like on behalf of a community, a nation that doesn't have sense enough to repent for itself. And 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 gives us an incredible passage of text. It says, if my people, who? My people, the church, the believers, the followers of God, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn 
from their wicked ways. Then I will hear their prayer from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. That sounds like revival. That sounds like something being rebuilt and something being restored in such a way that's not just shallow on the inside, but it's got more going on on the inside than it's got going on on the outside. And that does not happen by us pointing our fingers at everybody else and pointing out what Hollywood's got wrong and what the government's got wrong and what politics should fix. It starts with you and me going before God and legitimately naming the sin that is in our life and then naming the sin that is in our culture. And that is the cure for culture. It starts with two or three gathering together in the name of Jesus and touching any one thing that they shall have it. It's on the other side of our prayer. And so I'm going to ask you this morning to just join me in a mindset of prayer. They're going to play some music and I'm going to actually ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm not asking you to do that out of a form of godliness or so that you can practice some religious act. I'm going to ask you to do that out of reverence for the holy God, out of reverence for Jesus. And, and what I'm going to ask you to do is to kind of enter into a moment where you just allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you places where that there might be sin in your life. Like, like, are there places where that there's unrepentant sin? The hurts and the habits and the hangups that we talk about so often, like we all got that stuff. But, but is, that, is there places where that that's become like real issues in regards to sinfulness? And, and that right now there just needs to be an acknowledgement of Jesus Christ. A willingness to cry out for grace. Amazing grace. That sweet sound that will save a wretch like you and me. And so this morning, maybe you're coming to the realization that you have never really just admitted to heaven, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a savior. But if that speaks to you, if that resonates with you, I would challenge you to lift your hand and begin a conversation with God. And I'm not asking you to lift your hand so that I can see it or a church can count it. Like, I think you lift the hand because it's a sign of surrender. And you're showing God, God, this is, this is my heart. And in the same way that like if you were in the ocean and a riptide got a hold of you and it was pulling you towards your death, like you would wave your hands to anybody, to a lifeguard, save me. Listen, Jesus is the lifeguard of eternity and he will save you from the riptide of sin. But you got to call out. You got to cry out. And it's got to be authentic and it's got to be meaningful. It's got to be coming from a place of faith in your heart to see the cross and to see Jesus and to see his blood is the only thing that can resolve your sin. Somebody else, it may be that you've kind of drifted from God and there needs to be like this moment of rededication. Like you just feel far from God and you realize like it's not God that moved, it was me. And today you're like, I need a fresh start. It's your moment to, to, to lift your hand and talk to heaven for a minute. There's a humility in the lifting of that hand. It's another thing that makes it so valuable in moments like this. Is it, 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 is your, as the hand goes up, pride goes down. And God says, I can give grace to that. Somebody else, it's like you, you've been kind of on the fringe. You've been on the kind of the peripheral. You've just never really been an all-in follower of Jesus. And today, like you realize, man, I'm done with sin keeping me on the shores I'm ready to have an all-in relationship with Jesus. I want to live to glorify his name. As your hand goes up, I want to pray with all of you. Father, we come before you humbly. And for some of us right now, like we're, we're like literally naming the sin. And we're, we're, we're ready, willing to do that because we know that grace is on the other side of it. And so, Lord, we're coming to you with heartfelt repentance right now. And, and God, there's, there's, a, there's a pure and a valuable gift that's taking place in our heart right now towards sin as we recognize, God, that grace is the only thing that can resolve it. So, God, we, we just lift our hands to you and we say we receive grace. We're, we're, we're grieving that sin humbly, God, believing that grace is coming to resolve and blot out and wash away that sin. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
God, some of us, this is the day that there's a turn going to take place. By faith, we believe that. We ask for that. We claim that. That our feet are going to turn in an entirely different direction. No longer the cycle of wandering in the wilderness of sin, but true freedom. Lord, may we be an all-in follower of Jesus, living to glorify his name through the power of his blood and the work of his grace. In Jesus' name, this church said, amen and amen. The Bible says angels in heaven rejoice if even one person gives their life to Jesus. I want to ask you, would you help me to rejoice for the folks that have given their life to Jesus across Three Trees locations this morning. God, we bless you.